Uh, so without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce to you uh, Alice Schroeder. Um, John, thank you. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. And um, thank you all for having me here at the University of Virginia and um, all of the people who were so welcoming. Uh, it's really terrific, but I especially want to say thank you to John because he uh, was very modest in not uh, playing up his role, but he was one of my important sources in writing The Snowball because of his role uh, at Solomon Brothers as the treasurer. And I found um, one of the things that occurs when you write a biography is you do get a lot of conflicting information. And uh, John was my sounding board. I would call him and say, um, these two people have said uh, this and that. Which one should I believe? And he would tell me. <laughs> and, uh, and I trusted him. So he was an invaluable resource and also gave me a lot of great facts and information. Uh, it's a real privilege to come before you. Uh, tonight to talk about Warren Buffett, especially at this uh, time of financial turmoil and crisis. Uh, as you all know, uh, Warren Buffett is the only person of our time who's managed to accomplish his wish of becoming so rich that when he writes a check, it's the bank that bounces. Um, <laughs> Um, these days, it doesn't take uh, quite so large a check to make the bank bounce, but it's interesting to see that when it does happen, it's Warren Buffett that they run to to cover the overdraft. Um, he is really a singular figure in these times. And uh, when I started working on the snowball, of course, things were very different. The internet bubble had just imploded, and uh, it was uh, just after the aftermath of Enron, and I never anticipated anything like this occurring, but I knew what he was like. And of course, much of the importance of him is that his ideas and principles haven't really changed in 50 years. So I thought that writing a book about him would actually be a fairly simple matter. Um, when you ask Warren a question, he always had the answer. When I would present him with a business problem, he always would have the solution. So the job was just to write it down. What I didn't realize was how quickly I would encounter something called Severide's Law, which is that the cause of problems is solutions. So having asked all my questions, having listened to his stories, and having gotten all of his solutions, very quickly I was presented with a problem, which was that I had far more solutions, material, questions answered than I knew what to do with. And I began casting about for a way to construct a narrative um, to come up with how to put together a book about this man's life that would be meaningful and present a set of ideas. And I, I had a few attempts that, that failed, but I thought you might like to hear about them. So here's, here's my first uh, shot at it. Um, the story began with a journey through the life of a 78-year-old man. It traveled back through the decades, tracing and uncovering a common truth that lies at the core of the most powerful investment philosophies, teachings, and models in the world. What you will learn today is the single secret underlying law of the snowball, a set of principles based on the most powerful law in the universe. All that Warren Buffett ever accomplished or attained in the business of life was done in full accordance with this most powerful law. Using this simple, universal law, the snowball offers the knowledge of how to create intentionally, intentionally and effortlessly a joyful life. This is the secret, the secret to everything, the secret to unlimited happiness, love, health, and prosperity. This is the law of attraction, the secret of Warren Buffett. OK, well, I passed on that idea. I thought it was not too good, but somebody else went there. So my next attempt, the snowball's action kicks off in modern day New York, where a blood-stained copy of The Intelligent Investor is found symbolically laid at the foot of the New York Stock Exchange. <laughs> the quest for the holy grail of investing led to a search that spanned the globe from London to Los Angeles, leaving a gruesome trail of interview subjects behind as evidence. The result was an exhaustively researched page turner about a secret investing cult, cover-ups of ancient mistakes, and savage vengeance against those who tried to capture the holy grail for themselves. In the end, I found the grail guarded by an ancient 78-year-old heretic buried deep in a maze of files under a pyramid in Kiwit Plaza. <laughs> I love that idea, but then there was this guy named Dan Brown who went ahead and used it before I got there. <laughs> um, 
So I was sure, however, that somewhere hiding in Keywood Plaza, there was a holy grail because I spent 2,000 hours with Warren Buffett. I did get to go through all his files, and I got to ask him all of the questions and business problems that I wanted to. And I thought, you know, there had to be a holy grail because um, I had heard from so many investors a little bit of um, irritation might not be the right word, but, you know, Warren always says that it's very simple. There's a few simple principles. And if he were only working with a smaller amount of money, he could earn 50% returns a year. Well, I've had a lot of people say to me, you know, I am working with a smaller amount of money. <laughs> if it is really that simple, why am I not earning 50% returns a year? So the question is, is it just that Warren Buffett is a genius? Is it just that we're all dumb? Or is the truth somewhere in between? And I think the truth is somewhere in between. I was sure that hiding somewhere in his office was the holy grail. And in fact, um, while Warren is brilliant, and he is definitely different from everybody else, there is something more to it. Because um, he does have a way of making the difficult look easy. And he also has a hard time uh, understanding or perhaps even admitting how hard he works. It's sort of like asking a fish to describe water. And there are some concepts that are so ingrained in him and so embedded in him that he doesn't really understand them himself. He's, he's just, they've been there for so long. For example, um, take the rule that he follows about asset turnover. Quote, no real investor likes to trade. It is never pleasant to part, probably forever, from an old friend, unquote. OK, well, that probably sounds like something that Warren would say, right? Or it sounds like something that Ben Graham would say. But it's not. That is from a book called Bond Salesmanship by Townsend, which Warren read when he was seven years old. So, and he asked for this book for Christmas, by the way. And, and whenever he reads a book, especially as a child, he, he usually read them four or five times and memorized them. So some of these ideas have been so ingrained in him from an early age, it's hard to know whether they're innate, whether he invented them, or whether he picked them up from sources like this when he was very young. Um, but he got a lot of reinforcement at a very early age. Now, for those of us who didn't, the question is, you know, what in Warren's papers and mental files will help us be better investors, even though we can't be the next Warren Buffett? Um, I did find some things, but let's first start with reviewing. There's four concepts that you hear over and over that are kind of the basics of value investing, and they are intrinsic value and especially applying the Phil Fisher qualitative investing concepts to intrinsic value. Second, um, ignoring the Mr. Market manic depressive behavior. Uh, third is the performance drag of too much turnover and too much diversification. And fourth is the Ben Graham margin of safety concept, which arguably is the most important idea ever developed in investing. Um, and all of these are very important, but when I studied and spent so much time with Warren Buffett, what I actually saw is that um, he invests and applies his investing. He uses these concepts, but what he actually does is a little bit different. And so what I'd like to do is take you on a little bit of a journey using a specific investment that he, I did not write about in the book. Uh, it was cut for length. And it illustrates principles that I talk about in the book, but it's a little bit too technical and at too high a level to have been um, put into the snowball, which is for more of a mass audience. And uh, also, just as an overview, I should just say that so much of Warren's success has come from just in training himself into good habits. And it's worth just saying that because, um, you know, it, he, he always says that the chains of habit um, you know, are too light to be felt until they're too heavy to be broken. And he's talking about bad habits. But it was Aristotle who said that we are what we repeatedly do and that um, excellence is not an act but a habit. And Warren is a creature of habit. He's the ultimate creature of habit. His first habit was hard work. You know, and, and I write over and over in the book about the fact that he was at the Securities and Exchange Commission digging up documents before they were electronically available. He was down at the State Insurance Commission in the bowels of the basement looking up files. 
He was um, knocking on doors of businesses, talking to the managements when they were saying, you're a pest, go away. He was sending Dan Monin around the state, buying up shares of National American Insurance. You know, he was always thinking and working, and a lot of his work was not obvious. It was not repetitive or routine. What he was doing was he was always thinking, what more can I do? Especially what more can I do to get an edge on the other guy? Um, now, importantly, I know a lot of people will point out that a lot of what he did, you can't do these days because either the information is so available electronically that everybody has it, or it's insider information that would be illegal to use. But the principle of the hard work that he did is still the same, that, um, you know, I was talking to somebody earlier and we were just sort of talking in awe of how hard Warren Buffett worked and the fact that, you know, most people would not work that obsessively, but for those few who do, there's a reward. And the main thing that he worked at was learning. The guy is, as Charlie Munger puts it, a learning machine. And his learning has been cumulative. It's been a tremendous advantage to him in business. He's got this mental file cabinet that's been built up starting when he was a very small child sitting in his stockbroker father's office, reading the financial statements and uh, descriptions and studying of thousands of businesses in dozens and even hundreds of industries over and over and over. This is really why when people call him with a business proposition, he can say yes or no instantly because he's got that file cabinet in his mind that is so deep. It does help to have a photographic memory or near photographic memory, which he has, but at the same time, you know, that knowledge, that, that learning is the second part of what makes him Warren Buffett. Um, and the learning was cumulative. I, I think that's worth mentioning too, that he's chosen to learn in a field where the knowledge adds and builds on top of each other. And so I think we could all be better investors um, for knowing that. Well, up to this point, there's not any great mystery to it. I think everybody knows that Warren Buffett has, um, or everyone who's read The Snowball knows how hard he's worked and how much um, learning he's done. But there are three other factors to his success um, that I would like to talk about and focus a little bit differently than he normally explains the way he invests, and that is handicapping, compounding, and the margin of safety. These are three concepts that work together he uses them in a slightly different way than he would think of describing them publicly. They're all discussed in the book, um, and I'd like to take you through a little case study on an investment called Mid-Continent Tab Card Company. This was a private investment that he did in his personal portfolio, and just kind of show you how I saw him invest based on his personal files and um, you know what he actually does, and then I'll update that to the present day. Um, this company was an outgrowth of IBM. And as you all know, in the 1950s, Warren did not use computers, but he was very aware of them. IBM was the only computer company of any size or importance at that time, and Warren's Aunt Katie uh, and her Uncle Fred had decided to invest in Control Data, which was a startup company that was going to compete with IBM. Katie's brother, who was Bill Norris, was founding Control Data because he wanted to uh, create a business. He thought IBM was slow and bureaucratic. And Warren told uh, Katie and Fred not to invest in Control Data. He said to them, don't do it. Who needs another computer company? And those were sort of his famous last words. They invested in Control Data anyway, and they made a huge amount of money. And what was notable about this incident is that uh, Warren told them not to invest because he actually knew a lot about IBM. He'd been studying IBM. Since 1952, it had been in court embroiled in an antitrust case for being a monopoly. And uh, Warren studied its financials even though by then he'd already declared IBM outside his circle of competence. But he felt that even though IBM might have to be broken up uh, someday, that its monopoly was so overwhelming, and you know, of course he likes monopoly businesses, um, that to compete with it would probably be futile. So what happened was that IBM did actually settle with the Justice Department. And as part of that settlement, it was required to divest of a business making tab cards. Now, I can't really see you very well, but there must be a few people who could throw their hands up in the air that are old enough to know what a tab card is. Can anybody, anybody know what a tab card is? 
Yes, I see two people. Okay, that dates me. Um, okay, so a tab card is before computers were digital, um, they actually read off of punch cards. They were called MarkSense cards, and these were big decks of cards that had holes punched in them, and um, they would be um, stuck in the computer and they would be read manually by, the, or not manually, they were not electronic, they were sent mechanically through the computer. So this company um, was formed because IBM had to divest of this business. It was an incredibly, incredibly profitable business. In fact, because these cards were trivial compared to the mainframe computers that IBM sold, it marked them up to get more than a 50% profit margin. This was IBM's most profitable business. So. Wayne Eves and John Cleary, who were two friends of Warren's, saw that IBM was going to have to divest in this business, and they thought, we're going to buy a Carroll Press, which was the press that makes um, these cards, and we're going to compete with IBM because we're based in the Midwest, we can ship faster, we can provide better service. And they went to Warren and they said, should we you know, invest in this company and would you come in with us? And Warren said, no. Well. Why did he say no? He didn't say no because it was a technology company. He said no because he went through the first step in his investing process. And this is where I think uh, what he does that's very automatic but isn't well understood. He acted like a horse handicapper. And the first step in Warren's investing process is always to say, um, what is the odds that this business could be subject to any kind of catastrophe risk that could make it just fail? And if there is any chance that any significant amount of his capital could be subject to catastrophe risk, he just stops thinking, no, and he won't go there. And it's backwards the way most people invest, because most people find an interesting idea, they figure out you know, the math, they, they look at the financials, they do a projection, and then at the end, they ask themselves, okay, what could go wrong? Well, Warren starts with what could go wrong. And here, he said, a startup business competing with IBM could fail. Nope, sorry. And he didn't think another thing about it. But Wayne Eves and John Cleary went ahead anyway. They started up this business, and within a year, they were printing 35 million tab cards a month. So that at that point, they needed to buy more Carroll presses. They came back to Warren, and they said, we need, we need money. Would you like to come in? OK, so now Warren is interested, because the catastrophe risk element of the equation is gone. They are competing successfully against IBM. So he asked them the numbers, and they explained to him that they are turning their capital over seven times a year. Uh, so a Carroll Press costs $78,000. Every time they run a set of cards through and turn their capital over, they are making over $11,000. So they're basically their gross profit on a year on a press is enough to buy another printing press. At this point, Warren's very interested. Their net profit margins are 40%. It's like the most profitable business that he's ever had the opportunity to invest in. Notably, people are now bringing Warren special deals. It's 1959. He's been in business for two and a half years running the partnership. Why are they doing that? It's not because they know he's a great stock picker. They don't know that. He hasn't yet made that record. It's because he knows so much about business and because he started so early that he has a lot of money. So this is something interesting about Warren Buffett. By 1959, people were already bringing him special deals like they're still doing today with Goldman and GE. He decided that he would come in and invest in this company, Mid-Continent Tab Card Company, but interestingly, he did not take uh, Wayne and John's word for it because the numbers they gave him were really enticing, but again, he went through and he acted like a horse handicapper. Now, here's, here's another point of departure from what almost anybody else would do. Everybody that I know um, or knew as an analyst would have created a model for this company and would have projected out its earnings and would have looked at its return on investment and da-da-da in the future. Um, Warren didn't do that. In fact, in going through hundreds of his files, I've never seen anything that resembled an, a model. What he did is he did what you would do with a horse. He figured out the one or two factors that could make the horse succeed or fail, and in this case, it was um, sales growth and making the cost advantage continue to work. And then he took all the historical data, quarter by quarter, for every single plant. He got the similar information as best he could from every competitor they had, and he filled pages with little hint scratches of all this information, and he studied that information and then he made a yes-no decision. He, he looked at it. They were getting 36% margins. They were growing 70, over 70% 70 a year on a million of sales. 
So those were the historic numbers. He looked at them in great detail, just like a horse handicapper studying the tip sheet. And then he said to himself, I want a 15% return on 2 million of sales. And then he said, yeah, I can get that. And he came in as an investor. Okay, so what he, had, what he did is he incorporated his whole earnings model and compounding discounted cash flow into that one sentence. I want 15% on 2 million of sales. Why 15%? Because Warren is not greedy. He always wants a mere 15% day one return on investment, and then it compounds from there. That's what all he's ever wanted. He's happy with that. You're not laughing. What's wrong? <laughs> um, and it's, it's a very simple thing. Um, there's nothing fancy about it, and I think that that's another um, important lesson because he's a very simple guy. He doesn't do any kind of you know, discounted cash flow models or anything like that. He's, for decades, he just says, I want a 15% day one return on my investment, and I want it to grow from there. Ta-da! And the $2 million of sales was pretty simple, too. It, was, it had a million. It was growing 70%. There was a big margin of safety built into these numbers. It had a 36% pr profit margin. He said, I'll take half that. Uh, and he ended up putting $60 million, uh, or, I'm sorry, $60,000, I'm thinking in more modern terms. He ended up putting $60,000 of his personal non-partnership money into this company, which was about 20% of his net worth at the time. He got 16% of the company stock plus some subordinated notes. Uh, and the way he thought about it was really simple. It was a one-step decision. He looked at historical data, and then he had this generic return that he wants on everything. It was a very easy decision for him. And he relied totally on historical figures with no projections. I think that that's a, a really interesting way to look at it, because I saw him do it over and over uh, in different investments. So what happened? Well. Uh, the company changed its name to Data Documents. He owned the investment for 18 years. He ended up putting another million dollars into it over time. It was bought out by Dictograph in 1979, and he earned a 33% compounded return uh, over the 18 years that he owned the investment. So it was not too bad. Uh, and that was, that was typical. Um, I gave you this example in part because it was the other time besides Geico that he got uh, a Phil Fisher type growth company at a Ben Graham like price. It was the most vivid example of that that I found. Um, but uh, it was a private investment and there's not a lot of public information about it available. So um, fast forwarding a little bit, you know, why he thinks so much about catastrophe. Firestone's law of fire forecasting is always on his mind. Firestone said that Chicken Little only had to be right once. And um, that's always the first thing that Warren thinks about. And so why is Berkshire Hathaway today not dealing with some of the problems uh, that other people are? It's because Warren passed on investing in a lot of things that he could have because the first question he always asks himself is, what's the cat risk? And if the business or investment has cat risk, then he just says no. And we could probably get into an interesting discussion about some things like AIG. Um, that was a stock that I was wrong on for a long time until I finally turned around. But you know, he never invested in AIG because of the cat risk. People brought in Bear Stearns and Lehman, and he never invested in them because of the cat risk. And he saves himself a lot of time and energy this way. Because if you ask yourself the cat risk question first, then you don't have to do any of the other work all those pages of numbers, historical data. So because Warren is basically focused on efficiency, you know, that's why he does that. And he's also very good at uh, being realistic. And once he figures out that something does have the cat risk, he never, ever kids himself and tries to talk himself out of changing a decision. So today, when you think about what's happening right now, with de deals like GE and Goldman Sachs, people are still bringing him special deals uh, that nobody else can get. Um, he's still making sure they don't have the cat risk as best he can. You know, he's making a bet there on the management, but also his own reputation as an investor, to some extent, can cat-proof these deals. And uh, he's still 15%. At times, he's taken less and lowered his standards, and he's usually been sorry when he has. Um, and 
when it comes to the market as a whole, he uses somewhat the same technique. He recently said that he finds the stock market attractive now. In his 1999 Sun Valley speech, he talked about investing in the market when um, the stock market's value was between 70 and 80 percent of GDP. It's somewhat the same method because at that level, his, obviously the whole stock market's not going to go to zero. He's got a huge margin of safety built into that, um, just as the 15 percent um, return and the two million included a huge margin of safety versus how fast uh, Midcon and Tab Card com Company was actually growing and the margins that it was actually getting. And so he's put his margin of safety into the return expectations and uh, he's using only historical data. You know, he's gone back and he's used years and years and years of data to arrive at the conclusion that, again, probabilities, he's handicapping that it's the right price to buy. And he doesn't really care if it goes up or down or up or down for the next year or two. He just knows that at this price, the odds are that it will do well. I do think it's really amazing that right now, um, three weeks later, there are pundits out there who are saying that the greatest living investor of our time and possibly ever is wrong for having made these investments and having predicted that the stock market uh, is a buy right now. It is, it is really ironic and interesting that somebody who, as far as I know, has never been wrong in making a prediction um, the people who make wrong predictions every day and have been in the past wrong in saying he's wrong or out there once again saying that he's wrong. Um, and also I think it's worth mentioning because we're talking about this handicapping concept, um, something else. Um, this is just a little quote from um, the intelligent investor which is that the margin of safety is always dependent on the price paid. If, as we suggest, the average market level of most growth stocks is too high to provide a margin of safety for the buyer, then a simple technique of diversified buying in this field may not work out satisfactorily. And, you know, that obviously applies to the market as a whole. And one thing I think that Warren Buffett should get um, a huge amount of credit for and a round of applause for is never, ever having advocated dollar cost averaging because it's, it's wrong, it's led many people off a cliff, it's not right to buy the market at any price, and you've never heard him suggest that anybody should do it. And I think he should get a lot of credit for that. Um, so in the end, um, I've liked, I'd like to just say thank you for listening to uh, this story, and I hope it gives you a little bit of insight into how he thinks, but in, it's also indefinable. There are certain things about him that are a mystery and will never be explainable. And there's one thing about him that you can emulate, but only if it comes from the right place inside you. Um, it's been said, and this came early to Warren, that the only person really qualified to advise you as to what you can do is yourself. And he calls this his inner scorecard. You know yourself better than anyone else does. You and you alone know how determined you are to make a success of any undertaking. And in the last analysis, about 90% of being successful in business is that indefinable thing, which for a lack of a better name, we call guts. And that is from the book, A Thousand Ways to Make a Thousand Dollars. Thank you, and I'd be very happy to take any questions now. Thank you, Alice. Let's have our first question. Uh, hi, I'm Josh Langsam. I'm a first year student from Darden. Um, your book has been extremely well received. Um, do you have plans for future work? And if so, what subject might you look to cover and why? Um, okay. I do. I'm sure that I'll write another book. I don't expect to write another biography similar to this one because a subject worthy of following this one, I, I can't think of who it would be. Um, I, I have enough material to write a, a very interesting investment book and I, might, I would be very likely to be writing about some of what I talked about tonight, um, but I've thought about some other ideas and it's best to just kind of keep them here. Okay. Yes. Hey, Allison, thank you for the uh, insights on the book. One of the things I thought was interesting is, given your background as an insurance analyst and his experience with Geico, when he stepped in in the early 70s, 
it was consider, in thinking you mentioned in the book, he said to somebody, I might have put money to work where I could lose all of it. But also, if I remember correctly, you talked about how he said to Solomon, he said to Gutfriend, you know what, I'll backstop this. Is, so although that sounds contradictory, it also sounds like maybe he was gaming it because he could recapitalize it if they, had their, if they still had a durable competitive advantage, even net of their gross liabilities. Is that the right interpretation or did I miss something? Um, I think there was a similarity between the two situations in that in both cases he knew that his reputation was the backstop. You know, he said, I put something into a situation where I could lose all my money tomorrow, but honestly, the margin of safety was himself. And with Solomon, um, it, you know, I don't think he knew he'd have to call upon it, but basically he was selling his reputation to them, and that's why he got the high price. And in the end, mm -hmm. he actually had to reach in and pull that reputation out and use it something that was very painful for him. I don't think he ever thought he would have to do it, but I think that's what the situations actually have in common. He was the margin of safety. Okay, thanks. Okay. Anybody else? I have one more, I guess. Um, a lot of Berkshire's success has come from Warren Buffett's partnership with Charlie Munger. Can you describe the dynamics of that and how that contributes to the company's success? Um, yeah, historically, Charlie Munger was uh, somebody who kind of kept Warren on the straight and narrow because he's one of the few people that really will challenge Warren's thinking. Um, you know, Warren is sort of awe-inspiring, and you know, there aren't a lot of people who will tell, tell him that he's wrong. And Warren does not listen to advice. I mean, he really doesn't even listen to advice from Charlie. He has the saying, when I get up in the morning, I look in the mirror, and at that point, everybody's had their say. And... <laughs> And, that, and, and that's the truth. I mean, he really, I mean, you should, you should try giving him advice. I have. Believe me. I mean, you see it. You literally see his eyes kind of go off into some weird direction. I mean, he does not listen. So Charlie is somebody that he actually listens to. And in the early days, of course, that changed Warren's investing style because Charlie kept getting him to focus on good companies, quality companies, good companies, quality companies. These days, um, you know, they're social friends. You know, Charlie doesn't have any role at all in running Berkshire, and he kind of makes jokes about that, but they're social friends. Step yeah. to the mic. What messages and teachings that Mr. Buffett gives to younger folks like me and just college students in general? Thank you. Um, well, I think that the most important thing that he tells um, students that I've heard him say that I, I hope people really listen to is to follow your passion, to do what you really want to do, and not waste time with resume filling jobs, and not um, work for anybody who makes your stomach churn, because um, you can't really get ahead that way. I mean, it may seem like it for a while, but in the end, the odds are better if you really love what you're doing that you'll really, really succeed. So. All you have to do is walk to the mic. John McFarland's good for a question. Thank you. Question, I mean, this is something that really surprised me, and you touched on it, Alice. Um, uh, you know, having, having watched how painful the Solomon experience for Warren was, uh, were you surprised uh, that he invested in Goldman? Uh, and uh, why do you think he did it? I was a little surprised. Uh, because he's taking some of the same risks. Um, you know, I think he's had a longer time to get to know Goldman's management over decades, and I think he's more comfortable that he understands the inner workings of that bank, but it's still an investment bank. I think that um, Warren has been impulsive once or twice in his career, and Solomon was a case where he fell in love with John Goodfriend. Um, Warren loves Go Goldman's management. He's getting another rich premium to do it, just like with Solomon. I do think the one factor that's different is that Goldman is going to be transformed in a, into a deleveraged commercial bank, and it's going to be operated with different regulation. And that, I, that is enough of a factor that I could say, okay, I can understand this. But yeah, it is kind of similar. <laughs> yes. That's, yeah, and that's the other problem is that, you know, he really doesn't, Warren doesn't love paying people to begin with. I mean, that's, you, you know, something that he does, I won't say reluctantly, but you hear him say, um, 
so-and-so, it would take three people to replace them, and then that's true, and then they wonder, why am I not getting paid three times as much? I mean, the, the people who work for Berkshire Hathaway are not paid, you know, like Wall Streeters, or even like they might make somewhere else. So um, when he started um, being on the board of Solomon, he was just stunned at the way people on Wall Street are paid, and really almost with a moral kind of repugnance at it. And there was some justification to that, because it's a heads, they win, tails, they don't lose situation. So Goldman, yeah, I mean, they, I, I, I you know, he's not on the board, and I, you know, somehow he's reconciled himself to this. Yeah. Alice, we talked about this a little the other day, but um, given the deep dive you did with Buff Buffett and Berkshire, and given your background in the insurance industry, I don't know the industry that well, but it certainly appears the company's trading at a meaningful discount to the group. Um, just what are your thoughts? I mean, I mean, just, it just seems like there's a tremendous disconnect, particularly the way you describe the company. They don't take cat risk. Um, there's a disconnect for me. What am I missing? Um, well, I always found as an analyst that the way Berkshire traded and the actual value of the company didn't have much connection to each other. There just wasn't a connection. And particularly, it was rare that you ever saw, and I think this is true of stocks in general, companies that don't, um, there's not a penalty for taking excessive risk, which also means there's not a reward for taking um, less risk. And the only way you see it is over a long period of time where a company like Berkshire is able to build its book value and that Warren and Charlie have the saying, don't go back to go. Well, so you see these other companies that are losing billions of dollars because they've taken the risk. Their stocks are getting killed. What, you know, Berkshire isn't. So to some extent, they're not going backwards. But in terms of the value, um, you know, it's trading at, you know, what you could argue is a discount to its fair value. It's not the cheapest it's ever been, but it's certainly not getting the kind of premium that you might think. That may be because of Warren's age. Please. Uh, I was interested in uh, hearing more uh, about uh, your relationship as a research analyst and um, the, some of the content of your uh, research reports, uh, specifically like your uh, philosophy for valuation uh, of Berkshire, that kind of thing. Um, well, um, it's been five years since I've done any research on Berkshire, but I had a, a model um, that I used where I basically valued the float of the company um, and looked at its future growth and then, in effect, added that to the, to the book value or put a PE on the rest of the um, earnings. Um, you know, and it was a very, you, you know, I suggested that people use their own growth assumptions because, you know, it could be, it could be anything. Um, I don't have it in front of me, but I believe it's published on the internet if anybody would like <laughs> to have a copy of it. Um, so, yes. Alice, I'm, I'm really interested in your view of the managers of Berkshire and the ability of Berkshire to retain them after Warren Buffett. Yeah, um, a lot of them are actually quite old and they won't be retainable anyway you know, because they're, it's time for them to be retired. Um, and there's some that I think are hanging around because they like working for Warren. Uh, so that's going to be a very significant challenge that the next CEO will face. Um, now they've got successors um, that they've identified for Warren. Uh, I think another challenge the next CEO will face is are those the right people? Because he's let the managers name their own successors. You know, uh, it's, it's going to be a challenge. It, it really, a lot of it depends on who they pick, they could make a great or a terrible decision of choosing the next CEO, the board could. Hi, I'm uh, Joseph Matthew, my first year at, Dar <coughs> at Darden. Uh, not at the risk of getting too granular, uh, I'm kind of interested in the scratch notes that you were talking about um, in the, uh, the one case you were talking about. If someone who was who is very quantitatively oriented and knows Excel, looked at that and put it into a model. Do you think that people could understand what's going on inside Warren's head when he's trying to value a company and then try and actually replicate that? Um, yes. I mean, what you would see is a column that said sales 
and a column that said expenses, and a column that said profits, and it would have Kentucky plant, you know, Louisville plant, Kansas City plant, this plant, that plant, and it would have first quarter, second quarter, third quarter, fourth quarter, 1958, da-da-da-da. And then it would end with the last quarter that was reported. That's what it is. That's all it is. <laughs> and that the difference from a model is it would not add the quarters up, and it would not project anything into the future. Nothing. So that's, you know, in other words, he looked at what had been reported, and he said they've earned, a million, you know, they've had a million in sales. They've earned, you know, this many thousand. I want this much. They've earned this. I want this. Can they do it? Yes, no. That's the decision. And the margin of safety, I mean, there's a saying, um, let me call it to mind. I think it's from the intelligent investor that um, the margin of safety, the purpose of the margin of safety is to re render forecasts unnecessary. Yeah. Let's do one more question. Now, on a little bit of a different note, a number of political pundits are throwing out Mr. Buffett's name as a potential candidate for uh, the next Secretary of Treasury under President-elect Obama. Um, from your experiences with Mr. Buffett, do you really think that this would be something he would be willing to leave Berkshire for, um, that is to take a role in Mr. Obama's cabinet? Um, he would have to be um, shot with a blow dart and dragged in chains to Washington um, to do this. I mean, I think they've already in sort of semi-announced who the candidates are, and the reason he's not one of them is because he would never, ever, he would never be taken away from Berkshire. He would never spend his day in meetings. He would never let somebody else schedule his time. But, you know, there's going to be kind of a kitchen cabinet of informal advisors, and he did that for Schwarzenegger. He'll do it for Obama. Okay, thank you. Okay. All right. Alice, uh, I want to thank you so much. Uh, I mentioned earlier uh, a couple of things. One was that uh, we have gifts for all our uh, presenters, uh, but they weren't going to receive those uh, in real time. We're making an exception in your case. So we do have a small gift for you. Um, I also said early when we started the, the conference that uh, Mr. Jefferson, as we referred to him, would be very proud of what we're doing here as uh, part of his academical village, his university. Um, he also said in a, uh, a relationship he had with a, uh, another of our forefathers uh, some 200 years ago, um, I don't think the parallel between uh, Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger would work, um, but he had a very interesting relationship with John Adams. And he once told John uh, that I cannot live without books. And I think that's appropriate. This, is, uh, this gift uh, has that uh, quote uh, uh, replicated. And we thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.